Okay, so today we are going to talk about non-Mendelial genetics. So before we've been talking about just regular Mendelial genetics, so um, where we have dominance and recessive, but that's not actually how things work in real life a lot of times. So not all phenotypes are going to be completely dominant or completely recessive. It doesn't always work just like this, where if it's heterozygous and homozygous, we'll have the same exact phenotype. So non-Mendelial genetics is looking at inheritance patterns that don't exactly um, match to this idea of genetics. And there's several different things that can cause this, um, like our dominance, if we have more than one gene corresponding to a particular trait, independent assortment of genes is not being um, being random. Um, there's lots of different things that can affect this. And we're going to go through several different types of examples. Um, incomplete dominance can happen as well as co-dominance, which we'll talk about today. Link traits, we're actually going to talk about next video, but it's also something that can affect um, the inheritance of traits as well as sex linked traits, which I think I also have with our linked traits. Polygenic traits, so multiple genes affecting a trait, um, are also going to be examples of non-Mendelial genetics. Okay, so um, normally in the past we have heterozygous is going to show that dominant phenotype. In this case, we have pink flowers versus white flowers, okay, um, where both heterozygous and that homozygous dominant will be that color. But we don't always see that. Sometimes we see where we have a mixture happening, like a pink, or we have them both happening at the same time, like this red or dark pink and white being shown at the same time. And we call that codominance or incomplete dominance. So incomplete dominance is where we have neither phenotype is actually being expressed in that heterozygous individual, but it is mixed. So they're both being shown at the same time. So it's kind of like being diluted is the idea. Okay, um, here is another example. Sometimes we're going to use the same um, letter to denote. We have our capital C and then they use superscripts. And sometimes we're going to just know that the heterozygous individual has a different phenotype because of the information given. Um, Codominance, on the other hand, is where both are expressed completely. So this can be where we have a pattern um, or where we have both phenotypes being expressed like in blood um, type. And we'll talk about examples of that as well. So here we have both brown and white happening for a heterozygous individual. Okay, here's some blood type examples. Blood type is a pretty common example that they like to throw at us in AP Bio. So in blood, we have options of A blood with A proteins, B blood with B proteins, um, A B blood with A and B proteins, or o, o blood, which does not make those proteins. Okay, so those are our different um, phenotypes. Our genotypes we denote by dominant or recessive. O is the only one that's completely recessive. Um, to get A, B, we have to have an A and a B allele. Um, to get A or B blood, we have two options. We could be homozygous or heterozygous, where we have that I showing that no protein um, for, or that recessive is there. So this is usually how we would denote um, our genotypes so that we can set up our Punnett squares. So this is going to be dealing with um, A, B and AB blood have those antigens present on them. And so um, they're going to be identified by different antibodies in the blood plasma. So here's an example of a question. So a man with type A blood marries a woman with type B blood. Their first child has O blood. So what do we know about the genotypes of the parents? And so what we can do from this is we can think about well, what are the possible genotypes that we could have? And are there any outcomes that we can have O blood being the option? Okay, so we have to have at least one showing that recessive um, that homozygous recessive genotype. So we have to have at least one of those there. And the only way then to have A blood and um, B blood is for both of those individuals to be heterozygous in order um, for them to be the parents for that. So um, sometimes codominance is also looking at multiple alleles because we have an A allele, a B allele, or the recessive no allele all, at all. So um, just getting that point across, instead of having two alleles, there can actually be three or even more in some cases. 
And that's where we're getting at our polygenic traits. This is where we have a phenotype that's controlled by multiple genes. Um, in this case, we have more than one gene affecting it. So an example of this is skin color. Skin color is actually controlled by 378 different genes, which is why we don't have just two options. We have a wide variety of options and differences in skin tone. So, and it's kind of looking at adding all of those genes together, what is inherited contributes to um, the melanin that's produced in, in those skin cells. Okay, um, other organisms also have this too. Polygenic traits are going to be influenced by multiple alleles. So here we have different colorations in birds. Um, so they're going to be a mixture giving us those different parakeet colorations and colors. Something else that can affect the inheritance is non-nuclear DNA. That's DNA that's not found in the nucleus. Okay, so some genes are located in organelles and not inside of our um, nuclear DNA, like the chloroplasts and mitochondria we've mentioned have their own DNA. So there are some genes that are located there. Plastids are also small circles of DNA that can be added to some organisms, um, usually like from viruses is a common example of where we can have plastids being um, added, but we don't have to talk about that as much right now. So um, they're going to contain that small circular DNA, and it is going to be inherited by the maternal side. So in animals, mitochondria is transmitted by the egg only and not the sperm. So if we ever see an inheritance where we're looking at a generation and notice that it's always passed down to the female but never passed down to the male, we can kind of conclude then it could be because it's from the mitochondrial DNA and not from the nuclear DNA. In um, plants, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts are transmitted in the ovule and not the protein, the pollen. So same idea is that it's going through the female and not the male plant. Um, not all of the DNA in the mitochondria are the same. So chloroplasts and mitochondria can contain different alleles, just like in um, our DNA from the nucleus. So prod um Progeny or offspring can have different phenotypes as well. So here's an example where um, chloroplasts can be slightly different. They can be uh, and cause different colorations in the plant, white or variegated, depending on the DNA from that um, from from that chloroplast. Okay, so those are the examples of uh, non-mendelial genetics we'll go through in this class right now. Um, next video we'll talk about some other ones, but I also want to um, have us look at. How can we do a chi-squared analysis with these types of problems? So it's very possible that you will be asked to do chi-squared analyses on um, genetics problems. So what do we use for this again? So remember, we're determining if our observed matches are expected, observed and expected, okay? So we can have a cross that we're given, like this example here, where we have seed color and seed shape that we are looking at. And we can observe and we can count the number of individuals we see that are yellow and smooth, purple or wrinkled, purple smooth, or yellow wrinkled. And we can observe that. And if we think, I think I know how it's inherited. Maybe I know what's dominant and what's recessive. We can test this with the chi-squared because we can say, I my expected is whatever ratio, and we can calculate out our expected and compare it to our observed and see if we are um, in the right lines with our chi-squared analysis. Okay, so our null hypothesis in this case is that there's no relationship between um, seed color and seed shape, or if you wanna put it in terms of observed and expected, that our observed phenotypes are going to match our expected phenotypes. Um, so no difference in observed seed color and shape and expected seed color and shape. Okay, so how we would do this is we would count. So we have a tally of our observed phenotypes, just like we see here, okay? And what would we expect? In this case, if we have, we can kind of see that yellow and wrinkled are really, really small. And these are kind of similar, and this is not. So one thing you might notice is maybe we have a nine to three to three to one ratio. So if we have this ratio, that means we have heterozygous individuals. Um, all around. So if that were the case, and we had that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, we need to figure out what ratio that would be for the 186 individuals we have total. So we add up all of them total, um, 186. 
if we have nine of those um, being purple and smooth, that's nine out of the 16, and we got 16 from adding up all of these. So nine of our 16, we're gonna multiply that by our 186 total to give us, we should have about 104.6 being purple and smooth if that's based on our expected. Same idea for our purple wrinkled, 186 times three over 16. Same for this one as well. Our next is one, so 186 times one over 16, so 11.6. Remember, we do need to keep, even though we can't technically have like part of um, an offspring, we are gonna keep these decimal points because it's gonna affect our number in the long run. So now that we have our observed and expected, we can put it into our chart. So we'll do observed minus expected. Um, and I didn't actually go through and put all of the numbers, but you can pause this if you would like and see if you can calculate it out and see if you get the same sum that I get at the end for our chi-squared value of 5.52. Now we're going to compare it to our chart. So we have um, to find our degrees of freedom. We have four options for our different phenotypes. We have that purple smooth, purple wrinkled, yellow smooth, and yellow wrinkled. So that means our degrees of freedom are three. P-value, remember we always use that 0 0.5 p-value. So we're going to use our critical value of 7.81. Okay, our chi-squared was 5.52, which is to the left of our 7.81. And if you remember, that means that we can um, accept our null hypothesis. And I, there we go. We're not rejecting our null hypothesis. We can um, support our null hypothesis. And that that's actually what we want. In this case, that means our guess about the inheritance, that 9331 ratio is online, it's on point. Okay, so no relationship then, um, therefore there is no relationship between our seed color and um, shape. The two traits are following Mendelian um, genetics. They are doing that independently of each other. It's just showing that it is being inherited the way we think it's gonna be inherited, okay? So this is just how we calculate these chi-squareds for these types of problems. So hope this is helpful. Bye guys.